Uh, so come on, come on up, uh, Ayan Islam and Spanky. Now, yay! We'll all clap. Now, I am going to on purpose not introduce them very much because what they are going to talk about is going to function as their introduction. And if I if I get into it. I'll just wreck it all. So I don't. I don't want to do that. I don't. They, they've got a great story that they need to share, and please pay attention because I think you will learn important things. So let me turn on your mics. Man, no, uh, no pressure. No pressure. Under pressure. I think I'm on. Well, awesome. So you made it to the last presentation of the first day. Nice yes. work, and thanks for being here. Certainly appreciate your time. Some friendly faces in the room on top of that. So um, my name is Steve Lazinski, and I am so excited to be here with my friend, Ian, yes. and getting to be a part of this. Thank you, Josh, for gently prodding us into this good idea, which uh, the more we did it, we're like, yeah, this is cool, and uh, absolutely getting to share uh, our experiences. So the whole idea of public service journeys uh, that are bringing all of you here, and I don't think that's a surprise. That's what this whole track is about. Exactly. And that's what we're, you know, things that we have done and being able to share that. Um, I know, so we were thinking back on, and, and we'll get into how we know Josh, Bo, others in the cavalry and the things the cavalry has done, but my first exposure was uh, a 10 minute lightning talk, sharing the stage with Mr. Botts over here, Carolyn Wong. And do you remember what year that was? Seven, 2017 exactly and Bo giving me the opportunity and whatever half-assed talk that I gave and he still lets me come back so this is actually my third time getting to be here so I'm very excited about that uh, especially on this 10th year so yeah and, and it's uh, special for me because especially on the 10th year uh, my journey actually started in 2017 um, when uh, I also similarly met uh, Josh and Bo as an intern, which you likely heard that multiple times this morning. The I intern. am that intern, the intern. <laughs> <laughs> Movie yet to be made and to come out shortly, just uh, yeah. FYI. But so, and the beautiful thing is that that's how I was brought into this community and learned about I am the Calvary, besides Las Vegas, as well as DEF CON. So it was um, very much an open arms and learning in-depthly about what what is a hack community, what they're all about, and also what your needs are and how we could also do a, uh, a service in bridging the gap between your technical expertise and bringing that to the the policy leaders, decision makers, and uh, uh, the, the wonks that tend to also be, live and breathe in Washington, D.C., and also in other parts of the nation and the world. Yeah, and the, I think the good part, too, that I've grown to appreciate seeing it and the different things that I and I'll talk about and share with you is I'll, I define hacking personally. There's what I would say a lot of you all that are the incredibly technical level that I listen to because I'm at least smart enough to know what I don't know mm -hmm. and to go to that expertise. But then there's the hacking, which is like an insurgency. You work around the system, you know the system, and you can get things done. So there's just as much of that, and that's that's some of what we'll share today. So uh, if you want to start off with intro introductions sure. after all of that. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ayan Islam. And uh, first and foremost, starting off with where I am today, I, and then I'll work a little bit backwards, but I currently work at the Office of a National Cyber Director um, as a Director of Cyber Workforce uh, within the Executive Office of the President. So I have the good pleasure of working for, for the people. And uh, recently, last week, we launched the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy, um, looking at how do we increase the talent pipeline and address the quote unquote shortage that keeps being discussed when the reality is there are a lot of good folks, myself included, back in the day, we're trying to figure out how to break into this field. There are a lot of folks who are very interested, but don't have the access to the information or the knowledge or the opportunities to understand like what are the career pathways, where are the opportunities, and also how to 
you know, get into the very same shoes that you are and become your colleagues to work side by side with you and um, serve, you know, the great, the great cause. So, but then to rewind how I got here is uh, starting off with an internship at the, well, backtrack, a Cyber 912 student challenge that happened at the Atlantic Council. Um, I was a graduate student uh, at, uh, in law school and saw that there was an opportunity to have a better understanding and, and an opportunity to learn more about cybersecurity policy and what does that mean in terms of the application of it. Uh, through that experience and having to see firsthand how it's not an easy job, it's actually like a team sport. Um, there are also individual players who are extremely smart, but at the same time, at the end of the day, um, uh, it requires also a lot of hands on deck. So uh, from there on, then that's where it led me to uh, an internship, and that's that's also where I uh, had the internship. Uh, <laughs> And being the graduate intern, uh, having a, a great chance to also support and learn about the healthcare cybersecurity issues that are um, happening across the board and the attacks on uh, our uh, hospitals, our health healthcare providers, um, and uh, and as well as um, schools, uh, small businesses. It's not just you know we we heard the presentations earlier today regarding the water and wastewater systems, and as well as um, the electric grid it's just like there's so much interconnectivity in our lives uh, that I just felt that there was like this mission oriented aspect where I could help and serve and give back and so that's that's where my sort of path into the the hacking community occurred and then also having the great opportunity of supporting uh, the first ever DC to DEF CON where um, uh, I'm the cavalry brought over uh, representative Heard and Langevin to understand and meet you know um, the hacker community and to, to say you know it's 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 less of you hearing it through news articles you are creating crucial laws that are really making a difference in how uh, folks do their day-to-day -day jobs and operate um, why don't you actually like listen to these technical subject matter experts and understand how you can better create these laws without um, duplicating effort or giving them additional burdens? So yeah, and then do I need to? It. That's not you it. Have oh, to do, the full do I have to do the full thing? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just thought I could like share a little bit later on that and like sprinkle it in. So. As a result of interning uh, at the Atlantic Council and having that opportunity of working on a lot of cybersecurity policy papers, I was then able to leverage all of that experience and um, transfer that over into the Department of Homeland Security. And this is pre CISA, the National Programs and Protection Directorate. Uh, yeah, so MPBD. So having, having a chance early on to see how uh, the agency that had the, a lot of responsibility of serving as a nation's technical advisor, um, but nobody really understood that they had a lot of the responsibility of both uh, cybersecurity as well as physical security and the infrastructure security side of the house, as well as um, looking at the risks and determining what are the ways that uh, uh, both providers as well as um, uh, uh, well, not only just domestically, but also internationally, how it is all interconnected, um, not only through our technologies, but as well as the supply chain, the business element, the also the social elements, how that impacts our um, uh, living and our public safety and security. Uh, so the skills that I, again, had learned early on through uh, the exposure uh, through the hacker community, I was able to bring that thinking, that mindset and ethos into the work and to help serve as a bridge builder. I, I realized that similar to what Spanky just said earlier, um, that I know what I know, but also at the same time, my ability to have an opportunity to speak to decision makers and C-suite folks who may not realize there is a business element, there's a reputational risk, there's also bottom line, if you need to speak the language that will like trigger them and realize, oh, this is, this is what's gonna impact me, then how do I take what you yourselves do on a day-to-day -day basis and frame it to them, not using fear, uncertainty, and doubt, no FUD whatsoever, but just giving them the critical bottom line of saying, you know, this is how it's going to help 
not only yourself, but the business at large, the organization, and this is how it's going to help the constituents and the customers bottom line. Um, so I uh, had the opportunity of uh, leveraging that experience, working with so, so many smart people, which I see like a lot of uh, uh, CISA colleagues in the room, and then also um, having to take that experience and work very closely with stakeholders in the private sector as well. Um, and there's also that opportunity where I got to meet Spanky through the um, aviation side of the house too, like yeah. uh, early early on. So there is that nexus that I didn't mention and um, leave uh, Spanky to talk about, about how we, I did mention earlier about the paper, um, which I supported uh, Pete Cooper, uh, who is the author of the aviation uh, cybersecurity white paper, and then there was a subsequent one thereafter. But having that experience then also opened up many doors for me where folks were like, oh, you, you, you wrote, you helped, you know, research and um, analyze and support the development of white paper. Oh, great. Like, we need that experience, experience too. Uh, so I um, say that all to say that all of these, like, layered on experiences, it ultimately served the opportunity for me to take what you're sharing on a day-to-day -day basis, the realization that I can only also do as much and as great if I'm constantly staying in loop with all the great presentations that come out here through uh, I'm the Cavalry Track as well as B-Sides and DEF CON and other places um, and taking that back, digesting it and sharing that with others to say, hey, if you're looking for a subject matter expert, I saw this great talk or I saw online or I heard from somebody else that these are, you know, this means to go talk to and get the ground truth. Awesome. Yeah. So, so this background as we're sharing with you is on purpose just because of all the intersections and that's what we're going to focus on and and I know it's hard to talk about yourself I on the other hand uh, so my name is Steve Lazinski Steve Spanky any of those work just fine um, I spent uh, 24 years in the Air Force flying, so hence the talk about myself and wave my hands and tell airplane stories later on. Uh, but I had a great time doing that. Um, in the time that I was in the Air Force, I had the opportunity to go off from flying assignments and get into cybersecurity, doing things with the Navy back before there was a cyber command, and then working my last three years at the Pentagon, my penance for all the good times I had prior to that uh, was where in government, in the Pentagon, seeing how government works, seeing it from both the DOD side as well as all the rest of government and things like that. So before I go too far, how many folks in here have never worked in government? So we're kind of jealous in some respects, so that's awesome. And then how many have it worked in government at some point? So yeah, good mix. So awesome. This is, this is perfect. Um, so that that exposure that I got and the things that going on there, and then they're like, oh, you came from a flying background. Oh, and now you're in cybersecurity and I had enough knowledge to be dangerous, but being able to talk to the technical folks and translate across to the policy makers and understand what was going on and hanging out with Tom Millar in the back row of meetings and uh, the things that we got to see and work on. And that's where I got into the aviation cybersecurity side of things. And like Ian said, that intersection, the first time working with the Atlantic Council, meeting Pete Cooper at a Cyber 912 in uh, New York City, which was awesome. And then Bo with the good idea machine of, you know, there's this report and Pete's writing the report and the things that got rolled out, talking about it publicly. So again, these things coming together. Uh, but then after that, uh, when I was in the private sector as a chief information security officer, getting to see that. But the fun part in my day job paying the bills was getting to hang out and help be a part of what is the aviation village and now is the aerospace village. So again, the intersection that uh, Ian talked about, um, going back then with the opportunity to join CISA. So I jumped on that train going back into government now mm -hmm. and working on the COVID task force. So we're gonna talk about the village and the things that the cavalry helped establish and then also our shared time on that task force, uh, and again, where the cavalry comes into all of that. And, and then my current day job is as a consultant. I'm happy to give you all kinds of good ideas and advice with critical infrastructure security and a, a number of other things that I work on. But really the village is, that's the big exciting thing and that's the fun time of being out here, so. 
Uh, and and if you need some PowerPoint, I got some skills. You can ask Josh. So uh, not to brag, but there you go. So all right. How about uh, when we first started working with the village? Yeah, no. When we start work, uh, started working with the village, I was um, at the time with SZA, and uh, there was a rebranding and a and a need to have a, a relaunch of the Aviation Cyber Initiative, which. Uh, is now a, a tri-departmental task force. It's with uh, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and Department of Transportation. Um, and uh, currently, TSA is chair and representing uh, the, the DHS on that front. Um, and while uh, FAA is representing uh, Department of Transportation, but at the time, um, TSA did not have a uh, cybersecurity office and equities, so uh, the responsibility initially was with CISA, with TSA being a very, very close second counter counterpoint and and, um, and, lead, and you know secondary co lead in that respect. So uh, there was a lot of opportunities in seeing that. Similar to also the the current theme with I'm the, I'm the cavalry. Government needed to have a better understanding of what security researchers were doing and thinking and what they were seeing and what vulnerabilities or um, uh, potential issues were facing the community. But come to find out, security researchers were also having a hard time connecting with the very manufacturers um, and uh, 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 software providers to essentially share the vulnerabilities that they had been discovering. Um, and so the uh, wonderful beauty of also serving as part of the task force and one of those initiatives was how do we create a paradigm shift? How do we change the thinking of, you know, we don't understand this community therefore, and since we don't understand, we're not gonna communicate with them. And that's like, that's not the case. Um, and so with that bearing in mind, uh, CISA um, took it upon themselves, seeing that there already was um, in a pre-existing coordinated vulnerability disclosure program and an opportunity where security researchers come in and, and have essentially a a third party, i.e. government, serve as a neutral individual and arbiter to help facilitate the conversations um, between themselves and the um, private entity that they were trying to communicate and share this information with. Uh, so there were, um, back in the day, like a number of presentations, uh, one specific to a uh, uh, satellite communications uh, uh, regarding um, a particular manufacturer's um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, if you yeah, think, flight. think back 2014, 15, 16, yeah. different things being published, what the media is reporting, black hat talks. I remember DEF CON 22, there was a huge presentation of this is why you cannot do this on airplanes with companies and pilots and talking about. So it was, that was the, the context of the things that I saw in the Pentagon that eventually IN's working on and where it's grown to today, but that was the situation at the time of what wasn't really being talked about and why having that Atlantic Council report and the work that Pete and Bo and others have done to start that P rolling down the mountain that turns into a snowball of goodness today. So yeah. Yeah, and, and essentially sharing um, or dispelling myths and preconceptions um, and uh, of of who uh, what you know communities were and stuff like there was distrust on the uh, towards government of course there was distrust towards private sector there's distrust towards the agri community there's just distrust all around and so the question was okay how do we um, undo these mm -hmm. these roadblocks um, and better communicate and understand how we we're all looking to you know address the same issue um but then at the same time um find trusted partners that could serve as a voice that could bring us all together so um thankfully that's that's where uh bringing those those thinking and the mindset helped also foster multiple conversations across across the board where we could then turn around and say wait aerospace village is now being stood up and there's an also an opportunity to further engage with the community, learn from the community, receive inputs, um, ensure that we're not uh, stepping on each other's toes or duplicating efforts or inadvertently, um, you know, shunt, maybe 
making you feel shunned when you shouldn't be. Yeah. So um, that's that's where uh, you know the the con the constant conversations yeah. and 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 being a part of communities like this mm -hmm. that are very organic helped. And and the uh, you know building on what I Ann said, what I got to see in the Pentagon, right? Sometimes government talks to each other, sometimes it doesn't. Then it's trying to talk to industry. That doesn't always go well. But at least we both hate talking to those hackers over there. There's our common enemy. We can dislike them. So getting past that, like watching that firsthand going, this, I've read about, this isn't a stereotype. This is really what happens. So the fact that in that context, when the idea of the aviation village, that's what we were in 2019, right? So I know Pete, Bo, Roro, Alex Romero, Katie, there's uh, Jen Ella, there's a whole crowd, and I know I'm missing names, but that crowd getting this thing going, getting mm -hmm. past that reluctance of, yeah, now you got two groups that don't really want to talk to those people at that crazy conference, but when you have an agency coming in, like Ian said that, but before it was called SZA, but SZA is much easier to pronounce. So uh, when Chris Krebs is rolling in going, what's up? I'm here in the Aviation Village. We're like, thank you. And helping that conversation and helping get over those obstacles. And when you have the government, and I'm just gonna keep pointing as Ian is government, coming in being able to say, yeah, you got a disclosure, let's talk about it. Again, if you remember 2019, uh, Rapid7 researcher Patrick Kiley had found a CAN bus vulnerability, mm -hmm. built a plywood cockpit to demonstrate what that vulnerability looked like because he had already coordinated it through CISA and revealed it and did all the right responsible coordinated uh, disclosure. And that was the beauty of these groups coming together, getting past these things. So talk about the cavalry's idea of taking diverse backgrounds and groups and coming together to do good, there you go. That is a hacker approach to getting things done that you had not seen in the aviation example until that time. So again, a testament to the, the great work of getting that going. And, and I won't go into the details too much, but yeah, there was some industry that's looking at like, what are y'all doing there? We don't think that's cool. Just a little bit of hesitation. And on any given day, there may still be some of that, but if you come by and see our village at DEF CON, Friday, <laughs> Saturday, and Sunday, uh, you will see a lot of that has gotten passed. And being able to bring these groups in and bring these agencies and the things that we're having is a tremendous change and shift over time. Um, I use DEF CON as an example, of course, it's the coolest event, that's why we're all here between B-Sides and all these other things this week. Um, but what that has afforded us is now we can engage with an audience the sandboxes at RSA. That business crowd has no clue in many respects of what these villages are and what they're doing and why would I wanna to talk to these folks? But they come in and they learn from either the partners that we as a village bring in, the fact that I'm up there on stage talking with a dude from FAA about what the FAA really does beyond being, being a regulator and in the cybersecurity world. So it's teaching a different audience. The other things we've been able to do is whether it's B-Sides, uh, uh, Patagon, uh, Patagon uh, had a conference in uh, Argentina. We we're able to speak with that. Unfortunately, it was virtual instead of in person, but that outreach and things of getting this community of people who want to talk about this, again, you know, the pea rolling down the mountain, turning into a snowball, and don't ask me why it's a pea and why it works, but just that visual of the growth of this little idea and the big things that it's been uh, having today. So we're, it's awesome. It is very cool to see. and when the TSA administrator is gonna come in and talk in the village, three o'clock on Friday, that is, again, showing you know, the value of what's happening from there. So we're excited to be able to do those kinds of things, so. Yeah, and uh, there's been also a lot of work also within government, um, not to make it sound like as if though they came along willingly too, yeah. right? There had to be a number of uh, various players, uh, uh, Steve's one, and then there's, I see a number of you also in the room that had to also like continuously share and uh, beat the drum about how it is important to come into these very spaces and, and listen to others that aren't a fed essentially, mm -hmm. um, or may not be, you know, sorry, quote unquote, like uh, uh, the, 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 per the perceived uh, shape and lens of a, uh, a, a 
professional that they uh, normally are accustomed to engaging with. It's like, no, step out of your discomfort zone and realize that um, you have to talk to a diverse set of groups. You have to di talk to a diverse set of communities to hear all the voices. And otherwise, this is also a national security issue. Um, you're missing critical information that can help make a difference. So that's that's also where you know also uh, uh, having to also like work internally to convince you know our peers across government regulators to say that um, if you really want to develop best practices, if you really want to make solid security directives, then you know similar to also engaging with key constituents, you also have to ensure that it is very diverse representation representative. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back um, and, and rewrite <laughs> some documents, which also take time. Uh, policy making and writing re regulations or even laws is, is not an easy thing and takes forever to undo. So while it may be quick to create, it takes forever ever to amend um, and Josh is laughing because he's experienced that many many times those painful points so um, but at least the positive point is is that you know have TSA um, actually even like within B-sides like tomorrow well we're gonna have a conversation uh, with TSA NASA and Veteran Affairs um, and myself with representing ONCD to talk about the benefits of working government and how we want um, more hackers to to be a part of the our community and to also help create and shape change and make things also a better safer place 1130 and higher ground I feel like I get to do these good commercials so uh, yeah and the conversation changing again the fact that these entities are here and it seems intrusive that government's here and maybe that's not a good thing but the value of seeing that like I said and, and what's coming out of it is great so um, and you can also career change. I mean, the one thing I didn't even, yeah. we The proof, that's that's exactly, being yeah. able to go back and forth. Yeah, like a number of you um, raised your hand about being, you know, both sides. And so you then have both perspectives and then you're able to help dispel the myths and, you know, share what the other side may not be thinking and be like, you may not realize, but this, I used to be a government, da da da, da and this is what I used to see. And this is how they didn't understand you just as much as we didn't understand you. and vice versa. Uh, so, you know, there is an opportunity to sort of help connect uh, the, the bridges and, um, and, and obviously, you know, do, do yeah. greater good. Um, I will say that the, the reason why I don't also mention this because I had a very short stint, nine months uh, between CISA and ONCD um, being in a, a think tank, um, uh, looking, you know, serving as a deputy uh, director for uh, cybersecurity threats and policy over at R Street Institute. And it was so refreshing, let me tell you, so refreshing to constructively critique what was happening in government. So for the first time ever, I'm like, ooh, the things that I wanted to say out loud. <laughs> and may have not been able to sneak into various briefing memos in the past, I'm now able to do it in white papers again and work very closely with a number of fellows who also are looking at a myriad of issues across the board. Um, and, uh, one of, and one of the points that we also looked at was um, uh, whether it was uh, you know, cybersecurity data and the potential establishment of a cyber uh, bureau of statistics to then also the uh, new cybersecurity uh, critical infrastructure incident reporting law, um, looking also across the board of okay you know are folks really having pragmatic conversations when we're talking about water security or also healthcare security so it was a great chance for me to like take all the network and the connections and the experience uh, from CISA from as well as the internship experience at the Atlantic Council and also being a part of this community then say let's have honest dialogue let's all get in a room and even if it's recorded that's great because then we can share it along with others in our communities and others who are not a part of the community to expose them and share that there is a way for them to also partake in um, in this effort yeah so i i teased before in the sense of uh working in government and i told you left the military went in the private sector and then i went back to government uh, the offer was at the time, right around when things were kind of going south in early 2020, like, hey, do you want to come over to CISA and work on aviation cyber? Yes, I like doing that. That'd be great to do as a full-time job. And then, I, uh, this was from Director Krebs at the time, and I describe it as the old bait and switch. 
It was like, what do you know about COVID? I'm like, you know I know zero. Uh, but that was at the time, and you've heard Josh and others, Bo, I'm sure, has talked about it here and other places, uh, developing the COVID task force. And the reason, the, the offer to me was, you're an old guy, you know how to do leadership things, team things, you know how to deal with government, you have that experience, and we need somebody to kind of lead overall when you have these outside experts, Bo and Josh, uh, I can't even remember, I remember Michelle, and just all their different mm -hmm. backgrounds, doctors, and all the things they could do, and then you had the gubbies over here, and then helping to bridge and make all that work so Josh can concentrate on getting things done. I deal with the grind and getting through and how do you make things happen in that sense. And then very shortly had Ian join the team. But again, that was the example of this diverse group coming together and the value of doing that. Again, things that the cavalry folks are like, yeah, of course, that's how you do things. Like that's cutting edge in some areas, tends to be in government, not all government, but in this case it was. Um, and so then the idea is, well, why would you ever go back and do that? It was a sense of mission. I enjoyed it. I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, we kind of need this going on, but really selfishly, yeah, and Bo's here and Josh is here and you get to work with these guys. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. I like those guys. Let's go hang out um, virtually and never see each other in person, but all right, close enough. Um, so it was, uh, it was quite the challenge, but yeah, that is what, again, in this whole back and forth in and out of government, Yes, I will go back and do that because um, I saw value in that and, and you know the joy of doing that, the joy of doing that. Uh, but uh, that again is where I and I got to work together and there's kind of two parts that we'll share as far as the coalition and the willing, I think she got to experience and the coalition of the unwilling that I got to deal with. So I'll turn it over to you. No, appreciate you saying that. Um, so and in the transition from aviation. So uh, I was supporting the aviation uh, cyber initiative. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, chair position was with CISA at the time. Now, right before the pandemic started, there was a lot of conversations of migrating that role and responsibility to TSA and moving the project over there, making them chair, particularly because there was uh, a, a, a a strong leadership support to uh, develop an internal uh, cybersecurity policy team and to have um, TSA take that the helm. So uh, in that respect, there, this was a very, very great and fortuitous opportunity because personally, I really liked all the, the work and the, the variety of projects and programs that I could do. Not that I wasn't interested in moving into TSA, but I just felt that the experiences that I still had potentially in front of me were still there in CISA. And so I wanted to explore that and pull the thread a, l a little bit more. And lo and behold, I, uh, I get a phone call and an email from both Josh and Steve talking about how they're joining CISA and um, that they're uh, tasked with building the CISA COVID task force working very closely with Department of Defense and U.S. Health and uh, Human Services Department to um, support Operation Warp Speed. Um, and just for the record op and just background, Operation uh, Warp Speed was at the time like a, um, a whole of government initiative to quickly ensure the uh, secure the security as of the supply chain, the distribution, and the logistics of uh, vaccine and therapeutics um, to battle against COVID-19. Uh, so, to me, that was a huge honor that I was being asked to come and not only work again with uh, folks that I highly respect in the community, but also to be given a very special position to serve as liaison to from the task force within CISA to and represents CISA to DOD and HHS and talk about what are we doing um, as uh, as an agency to offer cybersecurity as well as, and this is the other awesome thing that I thought that it, about was that it was gonna open the aperture a little bit more to see also how the infrastructure security, the house, how side of the house worked and where were the, the linkages between the two um, and how we can ensure that there's 
greater cross communication, cross functional communication between divisions, between teams, also on the regional side of the house, um, and being much more further connected with our various federal partners and agencies on the ground, such as uh, uh, FBI and then uh, multiple parts of HHS and, and DOD, and then and seeing the very local connections to companies, to the distributors, to hospital um, uh, um, and um, uh, uh, delivery organization, healthcare delivery organizations, and ensuring that any information that was happening locally on the ground was being then also transmitted up to HQ. Um, that being also that being primarily, you know, the Operation Warp Speed folks, um, and sharing that this is what we're seeing with our boots on the ground across the space. Um, and I loved when uh, my colleagues would tell me that uh, God bless me for hurting what quote unquote cats. And I tell them, luckily for you guys, I like cats. <laughs> I think ca each cat is a cool cat with a different set of personalities. And do I have to tackle even individually? So be it, yes, it's okay. But it's that sort of like f optimistic lens and framing that like helped we were we very, get through we were the very, coalition of the willing with what was it like i yes. think 200 folks every other day for yeah. like a daily sync to talk about army yeah what, army <laughs> staff meetings and we were very thankful because i had that role momentarily i'm like thank you ian for so happily taking this on yes yes yeah, i was very appreciative yes yes and that's and that's the other thing though too is it was fostering a lot of uh 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 coordination and collaboration um, as you as you can imagine right um, uh, there there is uh, different organizations and you probably also it, you know it's also uh, anywhere in any field in any discipline in any organization there's gonna be turf wars there's gonna be that sense of wait I talk to these people all the time why are you now having to talk to them I have these relationships and it's like well because in this specific instance this is within our mission set our authority now granted we still need to work closely with you because yes you may have a closer working relationship and this is where we'll negotiate right so there were instances where having to talk with various uh, regional representatives to understand, okay, who had the more longstanding relationship and whoever had the most longstanding relationship would serve as the lead. Um, because in truth, we didn't want to fracture pre-existing relationships, instead use as an opportunity to foster introductions, build new relationships for others who may have not had it before. But again, leading with the trusted partner, leading with that voice who can bring, even, even within government, other agencies to the room, to the, to the teleconference, to the right. Zoom and or WebEx or Teams, whatever the virtual conference the platform was at the time. So, and uh, I know for some of you that have heard Josh talk before, and I cannot do it justice, but the ball bearing idea again, the diversity of the folks that came up with that, that that did the work behind it, and then putting it into action. Right again, just another example of taking that different mentality, things that folks who are not used to working differently, they have certain things that they have to worry about and bringing in that outside talent and that diverse experience and getting to see that firsthand. Ian's happy optimism, which brings me joy to hear it again, and it certainly did at the time. And I mentioned before, the Coalition of the Willing, the folks who were really focused on that. And what she described with Warp Speed, Warp Speed was a massive effort and it was still one part of what this entire task force was was trying to get a handle on and deal with. The other part of it, uh, if you know CISA's mission is you've got your regions and CISA delivers cybersecurity services. And so how do you, how do you get a company that has amazing cybersecurity because they got all kinds of money and all kinds of ability to hire talent to take services from the government? And they don't realize there's some really good stuff out there. Okay, you don't need some of these other things but this other stuff's really good and you do benefit from it. It is free. worth your time, right? Free. Exactly, and it's free. But then there's also these lower end companies that are like, why are you calling me? I don't even know who you are. I've got one dude manning, managing this router he bought from the store. What's the big deal? Well, in that ball bearing analogy, you're the one making the thing that everybody else needs. So please let us help you. Um, and so talking to those companies 
was quite an experience. What I got to deal with was the side of it. And it wasn't necessarily, I did get to talk to the companies directly and use those examples of, dude, big company, I'm telling you there's value here. And then, uh, you know, talking to the little ones also. But really the example is, uh, when I say the coalition of the unwilling, coming in from the outside, looking at what folks are doing, look at all the stuff they have to deal with. Oh, and we're in a crisis. And remember, this is also in the, this is towards the end of 2020. So you've got, they're already worried about the election. There's a little bit of turmoil at CISA at the time based on some Twitter posts. And then you had early in 21, right? So people are busy. There's a lot, there's mayhem. And we're all separated trying to do this with COVID on top of that. And so when it comes to, hey folks, uh, you have your expertise. I know people who have expertise, but I'm here talking to you and we're going to we're going to try to do more to get these services out there. That's not how we do it. Like direct quotes. It was the that's not how we do it here. And I'm like, oh, man, I, I've heard this as stories people tell, but actually hearing that I'm like, OK, I get that. But what if we tried something new? Because this is your success rate offering and getting somebody to an accept a service. And well, but that's not how we do it. And there's just, again, this friction in some cases outright pushback and in most cases just a lack of understanding because here's this dude coming in and here's these other folks and here's all these other things they're dealing with so in those conversations seeing some of the folks absolutely are like this is great we can't wait whatever help you can give us we're willing to do it and there was the other end of the spectrum that's like I'm tired of hearing you talk to us. I know you're in charge, uh, but I don't care. This is how we do things over in my little piece of the world. And then there's in the middle that took some convincing and went either way. Um, but it was interesting in the sense that I don't think that's a government thing. It was interesting to be back in government trying to work on that. It's a natural human thing. Believe it, don't believe it, convince. And so having the opportunity to go, okay, let me bring in Bo, who's actually been a product manager who knows how to do these things, who knows how to convince people how this stuff works and, and you know all of that. And the other folks that we had there, Tom sitting here in the audience, he was a part of our group. Josh was a part of that, reaching out, doing stuff. Yes, you have to admit you were a part of that. Yes. It's on your resume. <laughs> I put it on your LinkedIn. So those are the kinds of things that we got to see. And it was interesting because again, using these approaches and the things that uh, I know uh, when I thought about this talk and, and the Calvary, I'm like, oh, this is easy because of course that's what you do. Of course we do these things that we're here talking about, but that is not always the of course part of it. So being, a, being able to bring that in, some folks just needed kind of that little shake to go, oh yeah, we should try something different. Others, you're never gonna change. Okay, I get that, that's mm -hmm. fine. And again, that's anywhere. Uh, but it was just really interesting to see that and experience it and especially succeeding to change those minds. So uh, that was, uh, that was, it was kind of fun Yeah, to say the least. Yeah, but at least the good thing was is that the, the knowledge and the resources that yourself, Josh and Bo and others brought in from what was perceived as the outside, right? As private sector really helped also bring in uh, and we saw that also too with a lot of teams, right? With those that experienced reluctance, eventually then, you know, bought into it. Some bought immediately wholesale, but then those that were reluctant at first, like when they bought into it, they saw the benefits of, oh wait, this is what product management experience leads, means and what it translates into my role and how I offer these services or even similar to a sales engineer. Like how do I, how do I showcase that my agency has these services that are free, but also recognizing that, you know, depending on an organization's cybersecurity maturity and their posture that they may not, you know, um, have to go all the way out for the uh, special high grade uh, six month red teaming and pen testing. No, that maybe fundamentally everyone needs to start off with these the basics, free, yeah. yeah, like these free hy hygiene services, like let's offer like the web scanning and, and recognizing that folks may have already have their own internal monitoring tools but if you layer that with another one that's free it might help you know give you a letter better visibility of your your you know um uh, network and yeah. your and your landscape and your assets and 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 it and we saw also on the on the 
you know, organizations that took advantage of that, that they also appreciated because it either validated what they're already seeing or it helped address like the gaps that they didn't realize were missing in some of the tools uh, that they thought were going to cover the, ba the basis for everything. So um, uh, it was a lot of, yeah, a lot of convincing, but taking that knowledge and bring it into government was super helpful. And we got a question or a point. We, we haven't opened it up to questions yet. Like we got. I'd like to open the floor to questions, Tom. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to lead the witness. Ooh. What uh, What did you. we learn during the COVID task force? Because I found this to be extraordinarily interesting, and I'd love to hear your. <laughs> I, I'd love to hear you put it in your own words. What did we learn about the makeup of all the different organizations that turned out to be critical infrastructure, especially maybe the, the ones that weren't obvious? Because you did mention Operation Warp Speed was all about trying to deliver R&D for the vaccine, manufacturing the vaccine, and delivering therapeutics and diagnostics. But I think there was, there was a lot more that we learned in the ball bearings exercise. Right. So I think it might be beneficial, like maybe to talk about some of the organizations that were some of the unusual suspects that we ran into, the, the friends we met along the way. Yeah. Appreciate that lead in. So no kidding, yes, uh, we're done jabbering in the sense of please questions that you all have. Um, I know one of the things, so I'll use a, an example as a CISO that I think will resonate in the sense of identify your high value assets, right? What are the things in your organization from a security point of view, if that thing blows up, we are not, this company does not exist. The company, the utility, the whatever. Or people get hurt and don't exist. So, you know, those are the two priorities. Um, and to me, the ball bearing effort was, those are the high value af assets and what was missed is, well, of course, Pfizer and Moderna, those are high value because they're the only four companies or whatever at the time that are manufacturing what we need. That's true. But if that company can't deliver that vaccine without that needle and that vial, and there's two companies that make those things and the other one, the other good one that, and, and again, I, I get to pile on what Josh has talked about many times is cold storage early on. We all remember that. And the fact of how many places make enough of the dry ice to hold the temperatures the right way, there's not many. And when you look at it from the very big and obvious, and there's many, many thousands, when you really get down to yeah, that's cool and all, but what's my most high value asset? That analysis really opened my eyes and how uh, when you get down to it, some of those simple things are the more important things. And, and then you have to look at it very different backgrounds, the different expertise that we had to go, yeah, okay, that's a big deal. Yeah, to, to tack on to that, there was also through the ball bearings analysis, which is essentially also a supply chain and distribution analysis, um, uh, which, by the way, is extremely phenomenal. Like, I, I, I wish everyone could see the document. It's, 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 it's a work of art. <laughs> to say the, the slides least. are out there. The slides are out there though, too. But um, in addition to yeah, like the the distribution, right, and the logistics with the dry ice. What was also very fascinating to see was that there were a number of startups uh, on the R and D side that had this one particular ingredient that without it would totally impact the ability to even produce the vaccines or even the respective therapeutics. Um, and just that one company, maybe, you know, based in this one state or this other, state, and just what, this was like literally the ball bearing, the linchpin um, that could impact it all. Uh, then there was also um, similarly with the, chemical manufacturing and the facility side of the house where you have that one ingredient, but then if there's an impact to the processing in that chemical facility, then that literally shut it down. So the best analogy I could think of was sim uh, similar to the, um, um, 
baby formula, you know, uh, distribution and the like. Like you, you, you have like one company that's making one thing that makes up the entire product, and this is something that's created domestically within the U.S. It's not something that we can get shipped abroad, especially since logistics was a whole other, you know, issue in itself. That that would totally set us back and you know. Uh, have that public safety impact. So it literally was a, 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 you know, a lot of times a matter of life and death for a lot of folks. Tom, did you have something else to throw out there? Did you have anything else? Cardboard. cardboard. What was the cardboard? Um, you got a better memory. Oh, is it the packaging? Yes. There you go. That's right. How how quickly we forget? Because there was also. Vi <laughs> Tom. Tom did not have any trauma from that whole experience. Clearly. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm really appreciating the opportunity to hear uh, uh, viewpoints from what I consider it sounds like inside the Beltway, and and I say it that way because I'm from Silicon Valley, and so much of what we hear, it's like. And in the news, it's, you know, three time zones away and in some senses a world away. Mm. And I wonder if you could take a moment to talk a little bit about the perceptions from where you live of the culture and activity that happens with the 40 million people in California and add another 10, 20 million up in Seattle. Uh, how in the in the context of all you've been talking about and i may just add at the tail end of it you know, there's this new thing that's getting discussed especially the last year i think you know the initials ai and uh how that's being perceived haven't heard any talk about that so the, the second one if there's time but the first one i'm really interested in mm -hmm. the perceptions from where you live you want to start off? Yeah, so appreciate that. Um, so I'm thinking about it in multiple ways because perception from the government perspective is that engaging with regional partners helps us keep a pulse on what's happening within that community, right? As you say, um, a number of us, particularly also with headquarters, tend to fall within the Beltway, the DC, Maryland, Virginia, right, the DMV. Um, and so there is also a recognition that we have to have multiple offices across the nation to like have closer ties uh, to the various communities that also influence, shape, and are respective to the sectors that we're also serving and also overseeing and regulating. Uh, so in that respect, that's where having close relationships uh, with multiple agencies that each of them having like a stakeholder engagement office and or even you know like a very localized programmatic office is 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 critical to then not only having that department agency function the way they do but then also to cross share that information now could we do a much better job of like sharing that information and understanding absolutely um but there there is also the recognition that like you said, not everything gets portrayed in in the news, and there's all not only different time zones, but there's there's also happening like you know all within Central America and then the South and and other places within the U.S. that um, uh, the 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 synergies of the work happen a lot behind the scenes, which is also why we felt it was important to like have this talk and share from our perspective our public service journey and how engaging with communities back and forth helps you know create that two-way communication lane mm -hmm. now when we're also talking about you know like you said with ai and, and what's happening i will um just share that uh the white house obviously has a lot of initiatives happening in that area and have even po pointed to the ai village that's happening in defcon um and so uh, if there's further interest i would highly recommend that you, you check out the village and see what they're about to to share um uh, seeing that there is a keen interest in ethical responsible safe 
use of not just AI, but machine learning and these large language models and recognizing that we have to also talk about the data, how, how it's being used, and um, is the technology also being used responsibly? And last but not least in the people aspect. So like with my with my day job, um, it's also having to have conversations of um, the awareness piece. How do we just educate and share awareness of the various skills, um, not just respective to one technology, but across the board. But then also it's like, okay, if you're interested in getting the field, how do you get into the field and ensuring that there's diverse, inclusive, accessible representation yeah. for all, so yeah. I, I love the, I think of what you asked as like the stereotype we hit on that a little bit, the panel tomorrow at 11.30 in Higher Ground. Uh, it's a bunch of gubbies, and the idea is what is the reality of working in government? And I say bunch of gubbies having been one, um, not just to be, I don't mean it to be derogatory. But the idea, and I've, I've talked about this before when I've used the example of the village, that the perception of this is what government and industry does, right? The dude in the white t-shirt, and it's an old white guy, that's me. I'm like, well, that's the government bureaucracy. I'm like, well, no, let me tell you. Yeah, there's some of those, but let me tell you about all the other people I know and their backgrounds. And then the same thing, if I'm talking to a different audience, it's like, well, this is what those those hackers look like. Ooh, and yeah, that's what they look like. And let me tell you the talent they have and why you want to talk to them. So I think similarly, uh, like getting past those stereotypes, well, you all in Silicon, you're just trying to make money and you're a bunch of started, you know, blah, blah, blah. The same way you would look at government, it's being able to go, there are some crazy smart people who really want to get shit done and they really want to fix things. And government, if government, other, you know, you name the group, if you don't talk to them, and I mentioned it before, if you don't engage them early, you're going to make all these mistakes that you could have brought in these different backgrounds get to know them before a crisis. So while you're working here, when things are nice and normal, or when there's a crisis, you can go, I don't know, but I can call Ian because I know where she works and she knows where I work. And we've had a, at least an introduction, if not a full relationship of working together. Um, so I, I don't think you'll ever get past that. And I'm not gonna say, oh yeah, it's all good. It's not, it's humans. And it's always work to do that. And these examples that we've used, I think, what I like seeing is, and I use the village as an example, the engagement that happens, the fact that spot the Fed at DEF CON is not very hard, right? It's, it's and, and Bryson had a great Twitter, Bryson Board, if you know him, had a great Twitter post. He's like, how about we spot not the Fed? Uh, that's getting more difficult. But it's, it's the fact that this is where the talent is. This is where the smart people with good ideas are. Let's go talk to them. And the villages like, we'll help you talk to them. And I'm sure the other villages are too. And so the policy village is another one of those. It's great to see. So I think it's at least working to get past that. So. Quick, quick question. So long time listener, first time caller, and I'm getting the BDI from Josh. Um, so you've talked about lots of different perspectives, lots of different groups, things like that. And there's been lots of lessons that have been called out from COVID task force and all that effort there, but from a sort of root cause analysis sort of double loop learning how do we fix the root causes of a whole bunch of these issues each one of those groups you're talking about does that at a different clock rate through a different perspective mm -hmm. covid was a really good moment in time for pulling all of those groups together in a crisis now there isn't a crisis do you still see that urgency across all of those groups to go hey let's get to the root cause of not being in this position again how do you how do you tackle that and in that one minute you have left yeah. well how do we how do we get there the, the uh, I'll, I'll throw out one of the best things in my most trying, why the hell did I do this, uh, jump back in. It's okay that it's frustrating and it's okay because it is planting the seed in their minds and something's gonna change. And the couple of people that our group made a difference with, they will be the little seed, the snow pea at the top of the hill and start rolling down and they'll get somebody else at their agency to change their minds and then they'll start looking at it different and it'll slowly grow and that's like the little bit of hope you know the little kid at the end of the star wars movie and he's got his his little insignia ring hidden away i'm like i i hope i created one of those to get those ideas going yeah um it's really interesting how depending on the sector, some of the 
changes that it took a long time to finally create are now sticking and improving and scaling and moving forward, um, such as, you know, the aviation aerospace industry. Like before there was a lot of, um, uh, uh, there was a huge divide and even, you know, ta talking to different communities and uncertainty. Yeah. Um, and in other sectors, there's, there's a, Fine, finally, right? There's there's a, a, a stern look at uh, sectors such as healthcare and um, uh, water and wastewater systems, and um, I understand that food is next, agriculture is next. But the the truth is, is that that's also still that's still going to take time and work. And this is where having the patience and recognizing that it's a marathon and there's, it's gonna, you're in it for the long fight. It's, you're in it knowing that, you know, you, you're gonna, you're gonna be doing this for a long time. As long as you have the passion, it's there, but also know that you're not alone. And this is the other reason why I, I decided also to shift into the workforce and education side was because there was a point in time when I was working CISA and I and, and work in addressing also and serving alongside a lot of colleagues with the Log4j response. I like also started feeling the burnout and I realized, oh my gosh, like we we need to have more folks, like more colleagues, more partners. So that way, when one of us needs to tag out, tap, like, you know, get a, a, a break and also spend time not only to recharge for ourselves, but also be with friends and family that, you know, at least we know that the the fight is still happening and that there will be certain battles that will be won. But this is this is a, a long time war. So I think it's that perspective and knowing that you you're going to have to also be strategic and picking and choosing as well like you know is this is this is this the one am i targeting this am i talking to the right person i'll keep going eventually there is going to be someone who's listening and seeing this right um and and so that's that's where um it's 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 a message of where i say keep going there's a lot of folks that are listening and observing um there's also uh, a, a keen interest also with my colleagues um uh not only you know within the office of national cyber director but across also um the white house and um across federal government where we're watching and we're listening and, and recognizing that there are a lot of things that we also can't do by ourselves we have to like work closely and leverage the communities who own also as well these um um, just want to tack on to his point. I mean, the, the honest answer is when the CISA COVID task force ended, a lot of people were thrilled to go back to normal. But Krebs asked us to break glass and to find common cause and common purpose. So the disheartening part is people did go back to silos in a lot of cases. The heartening part is people like Ayan who intrinsic, intrinsically believe in boundary spanning and cross sector and cross agency. They're in the seats now in the White House. They don't have to be convinced that multi-party, multi-talent team Avengers is, a, is valuable. They're not just singing the song, they're adding to the music. So I'm a little, it's like two steps back, maybe five steps forward, but it's been, uh, that's why I'm so thrilled to see her in that role and so many others in ONCD. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.